This is where my life began. I was born to a single mother, addicted to alcohol and drugs, in a very poor environment. Only father figure I ever knew was an uncle who raised me until I was 10. Uh, I remember my grandmother and aunt coming in the apartment. I was upstairs with my sister. I remember my mom just screaming like she was being murdered downstairs and went down there and that's when I knew something was really bad happened. And then my aunt actually came upstairs and told me that he had died. I remember that feeling like it was yesterday. That man was my hero. Dealing with the hurt of losing him was, was huge. I had a sister who was five years old at the time. We found ourselves bouncing from place to place, not sure where we were gonna sleep, never a place to call our own. Um, no bed sometimes, bouncing back from home to home, house to house within the neighborhood or with family. That's about the time in my life that the bitterness and anger began to build up and became a huge problem for me. During this time, there was a, there was a lady, she was a children's pastor at a church. Her name was Marcy. That name, anytime I hear it, still carries a ton of weight with me, um, even to this day. She took an interest in us. She, was, um, she had heard about us through a friend. She started coming and taking us to church every Wednesday night and Sunday morning and uh, helped my mom find a job, helped her find a place to live. Life kind of seemed normal again for a little while. But six months later, my mom stole from the job she was at. She went to prison for the next five years. We were back in the exact same situation that we were in before it seemed like. So the anger and this bitterness just built right back up again at the, the situation I was in. Uh, Marcy helped us find a place um, to live temporarily until she could find um, something more stable. While going to church there with her, I found myself in a Sunday school class with Truett Cathy who founded Chick-fil-A. And he was one of the few people in my life up until that point that actually took an interest in me and respected me and, and actually acted like he cared. Began to invite me over to his house a lot. Um, Ended up adopting me and my sister. Stayed over there quite a bit for the next you know, year, year and a half. Went back and forth to work with him. He ended up transitioning us to a group home at the Rock Ranch, much more structured environment. So we went down there, stayed there until I graduated high school. I hated it, because I was used to no structure and kind of coming and going as I please. I was the, the father figure basically for my sister most of the time when my mom was out um, binging. So I didn't mesh well with the parents and the structured situation, so it continued to build into my bitterness and hatred and all the anger I was building up over the years because of my circumstances. As Soon as I graduated high school, I got out of there. Um, my mom had gotten out of, out of jail and started trying to get her life right. And during that time, she had found out that she had cancer. I was still dealing with a lot of anger towards her, so I was there you know, visiting with her back and forth, ended up staying with her right there at the end. She, um, she did everything in her power to try to make things right, and I made it impossible for her to do so with myself just because I wanted to make her feel every bit of pain that I felt. I remember the time having to call the ambulance, rush to the hospital. Um, I never knew that, the la that, that last time in the apartment before we had to call the ambulance um, was the last time I'd speak to her because she never became conscious again. Even to this day, dealing with the guilt of the way I treated her in those last days is, um, is tough to swallow for me as a man because like I said, I'd, I'd give anything to be able to go back and, and make those things right for her and make her feel good about herself right before she left this world. During the time when I was staying with her, I uh, really got involved with cocaine, started drinking it really heavy. It was, more of a, um, it was more of a medication for me. I was medicating myself to get my mind off of things I know because it made me feel good. It made me not think about everything that had happened. It made me not so angry, it made me happy. I remember there being days when, you know, I'd start drinking and snorting coke on a Monday and we'd wake up on Thursday and we'd lose two days and have no idea. While I was staying with her, I had a, had a guy I used to love playing basketball, so I'd go down to the court down the road from the house there where she was staying at. Met a guy who was really involved in a lot of big drug activity and illegal activity in the area. He took an interest in me because I played basketball there and they would bet money on the side courts and so we, we, became, we, we bonded and got a little friendship. He began giving me jobs to do. The job I was given was to take a duffel bag, anywhere from $200,000, $250,000 of, of drugs. I'd run it to a location out of town, pick up another duffel bag of cash, bring that back to him, and you know, I'd take my payment from there. Made good money over the next you know, year or so doing that. Um, and then through the time, me and him got pretty close. He was almost another father figure for a short time. He, he, was, he was somebody who took an interest in me. 
He was somebody who showed loyalty to me, which I was, you know, desperate for at the time. Got under investigation by the GBI Narcotics Task Force in, I think, four counties. So um, they ended up raiding our apartment. Had been gathering proof for months from what I heard, uh, with probably 25 to 30 officers stormed our apartment that night. Took me in, but at the time I had, had no desire to try to better myself. Didn't really like myself, so. I could care less what the consequences were. I just went right back into it the very next day. The last run I made, we uh, never knew what was gonna be my last run. I thought I'd be doing that the rest of my life. Dropped off the, the bag like usual, took the other bag. When I, was, when I was younger, man, it was a song that always kind of tugged at my heart and my emotions. It was called Jesus Is The Answer. So that song was playing on the radio. I hadn't heard it in years. And um, it, it shut me down. I had to pull over on the side of the road. I was weeping like a baby. As I'm weeping on the side of the road, um, prayed to receive Christ right then uh, on, in my car with a God knows how much money in a duffel bag in the back of my car. From there, went back to uh, the location just like usual, dropped off the money, told him about what happened. He had me go into a room, had a chair in the middle of the room, um, half the time with a gun in the back of my head trying to make sure I was telling the truth. I remember bawling, begging um, for them to believe me. We get done with the interrogation. Um, he lets me go. Back when I was living at the Rock Ranch, they would take us to a church. I didn't like the church at all, but uh, there was a youth pastor there. That, uh, while we were there, he always treated me with respect, treated me like I was just anybody else. He was the first person that came to mind for me to call. Called him, told him about it, immediately went to his house. We talked about it, took me right in like I had never left the church, got me back involved. Um, became a great mentor for me over the next couple years. Met my wife during this time. My, my goal was to, to start a family. God put my wife in, in my life at the, the best possible time. We began, um, began our family, had a son a year later. Being that I was a new, new Christian, um, dealing with the stuff I was dealing with, I was very open to people who were in my circumstances. So people that, that were naturally attracted to me were people who were struggling with the same struggles I've had drugs, alcohol, um, sex, whatever it may be. We got a lot of resistance from people who were Christians who had been in the church a long time who didn't want to associate with those kind of people. Um, that's where the message of, of Unlearn happened. My entire life is, is that example of being in an environment and in a society that tells you this is the way you're supposed to end up and this is the opportunity you have, so this is the only opportunity you take. Um, I was lucky enough to have people step in to teach me otherwise. And without them, I would have never came out of that lifestyle. I would have been a part of the same cycle that I watched jail, drugs, overdoses. My passion now is just to make sure that we open a door for everybody who's in those exact same circumstances to, to know that there's an opportunity to better themselves, to do something different, and give them the option to do that and not let society tell them anything differently. Give them the opportunity to be whatever they want to be. But in order to do that, we've got to unlearn the way that we're the way that we're doing things in those societies and the way that we teach people and the way that we accept people, the way that we love people, and especially as Christians and teachers and anybody in a leadership position, we've got to unlearn our mentality on the way we view people like that. My name is Kevin Hawkins, and it's time to unlearn.